Hey, what's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Strategies Wealth, Health, and Self Show. I'm your host, Jared Beldier. And today I get a chance to talk to a longtime friend and colleague, James Smith. Now, a little backstory on how I met James. It was my seventh year in Arizona. I had played left tackle my entire career, and I was moved to the right side. And things were going very poorly. And uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to continue to play football or not. And Larry Fitzgerald stepped in, being a great team leader, and gave me the number of somebody that he has used during his career uh, to help him get his mind right and you know, function at his best. So that's how I got introduced to James. And as soon as I talked to him the first time, I was hooked on his philosophy and the psychology of what he had to explain. And he really helped during those last three years of my career propel me to a mental state that I had never reached in those first seven. I wish I would have had him my whole career. He's amazing. Anytime I'm talking with James, it gets uh, it gets deep. He's a very intellectual guy, and he has some amazing ideas, amazing philosophies, and one of his passions is culture. And culture is a very sophisticated, very complex issue, and I wanted to reach out to James and see if he would break it down with me on the show. So you guys are in for a real treat. I don't want to spoil any of the good bits from the episode, but we hit on how criticism and conjecture are vital to a proper culture and how eliminating dogma takes out the danger of that culture because that disallows criticism and conjecture to happen. And that's how you move forward in a proper culture. We also explain what to do if you're stuck in a bad culture. Say you're at work, you like your job, your job is good, but the culture is toxic, it's a bad culture. What do you do in that instance? James also gets to share his new business, Novacend, that is all about optimizing culture in the workplace. It's some awesome stuff. I think he's onto something here, and I think you will enjoy our conversation on culture. So without further ado, here's my talk about culture with James Smith. James, how you doing? Doing good. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. Thank you. James, how would you define culture? There's a few different ways to reference it. The simplest answer is the set of ideas that influences all thinking and all behavior. However, we have to go further than that, in my opinion, to, fur- to fully encapsulate what it means and what it signifies. And so a few other ways to reference it. From an evolutionary biological perspective, you might hear culture described as information that is coded in our DNA that is traced back in terms of the concentration of its influence approximately seven generations due to the way that the, you know, the, the genes half, if I remember correctly, every generation, that about seven generations for the most sort of meaningful starting point for what any single one of us is actually working with and how this coded information may possibly influence our thinking and behavior more than the influences that each individual experiences phenomenologically. So that sounds like a big ask, but what, what, what this is proposing is that, you know, who we were raised by, how we were raised, what our pre-adolescent peer group influence was may be secondary to what is in our DNA. This is one possibility for culture. If you look at the dictionary reference, you get something to the effect of the arts, the aesthetics, the sum of intellectual achievement, human intellectual achievement regarded collectively, something like this. So regardless of of which definition one is most captivated by, I think it's clear to state that what culture is far more greatly signifies a thing that is more voluminous than what most people think in terms of the set of influences. Excellent. Yeah, that is, that is a great encapsulation of, of culture as a whole. Now, zooming in and getting into uh, the culture within the business world, how does that tie in with the, the global culture, the regional culture, 
and the culture of the business itself? Yeah, that's a good question. So if we can agree that culture, broadly speaking, is this set of ideas that influences all thinking and behavior, then what we have to understand is in no context can there be a entity or a professional occupation or just any localized circumstance that is encompassing the totality of cultural influences. So as you rightly said, local, regional, the most that can be done in any case, regardless of how concentrated it is, the, you know, the, the, the culture that exists between two people, and then you scale it up from there to the culture that exists in a country, the, the most productive culture can only be steeped in one thing, which is criticism, right? Now, this is, I'm, I'm pulling from David Deutsch and the late philosopher Karl Popper here, in which most of what is understood as culture, Jared, is actually ethics. Now, ethics or morals are an example of components of culture, but to say that an organization, say, has a culture of, say, customer first, or a, a culture of integrity, or a culture of seeing things through to their completion, this dangerously toes the line of dogma, right? Because dogma is the information that protects itself against, against being criticized, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the principles, it's the tenets that disallow themselves to be challenged. And so this is the hazard that any company runs thinking that the culture they're setting is an effective one if that culture in any way consists of anything other than criticism. Because once you say, all right, we're going to re reform our culture here, say there's a new CEO, new leadership, and now the culture is something else, and it's this one or two or three word phrase, this dangerously runs the risk of being authoritarian, right? Because what if some member of that workforce interprets that as, oh, great, here's, here's the new set of ideas that we're all supposed to adhere to. And I didn't have any say in whether I think this is a good idea or not. And so this is the problem that what most individuals think is culture is not at best. Maybe it's components of culture. And once we understand that it's the set of ideas that influences all thinking and behavior, then the only most effective culture that can be set is simply one of criticism because that's what allows for constant progress. Nothing will stay the same or outlive its expiration date if the culture is set in criticism. And how do you set up a culture that is set in criticism in a beneficial way, in a way that works with all levels of employees from whoever's at the bottom to who is ever at the top? How do you do that? Yes, that's another good question. And that, in fact, keys towards the consulting business that we talked about offline that I'm involved in, in that these, these are some of the questions and problems that I've thought about for a long time. And so what I have come up with in this regard as an example of how to answer your question is it, it has to work top down. This is the most important thing. Top down guided, which is much differently than top down instructed. And that's how I differentiate between having an open culture of criticism versus one that runs the risk of being tyrannical or authoritarian. And that we want the very top level, such as the CEO, to be the first one who is presented with this knowledge and has the opportunity to assimilate it followed by the executive team, the C-suite, right? And this is how we gradually work our way into the entirety of the organization. So CEO first, one-on-one -on -one consulting of these strategies that I've developed. This is my example, followed by the C-suite. And then I'm, well, rather my team is developing a mobile application 
that will contain the same exact strategies, consulting information that I'm covering with the CEO and C-suite such that this system level optimization can be instantiated by way of every single individual in the organization becoming knowledgeable as to these concepts, as to these strategies. And so that's, that's the way that I've answered your question of how this can be entrenched within an entire company. Excellent. Seems like it's pretty reasonable and that, you know, there, if the strategies are in place and then are followed, um, it can be done uh, with not maybe the degree of difficulty one would think when they, when they set out to, you know, on this quest of how to reshape culture in a way that benefits the business, um, you know, with, with those principles of, of conjecture and criticism at the forefront. Now, how do you get into critic? you know, how do you get into a culture with based off criticism and conjecture without getting overly emotional or, or having people get set up, you know, people getting triggered. I know right now there's just, uh, you know, a hyper emotional state. Really, you know, you could argue globally. Um, I know for certain in the United States there is. And, and like you said, uh, culture, uh, you know, expands to, to everything. It covers everything. So if you're part of a culture, uh, when you zoom out all the way, that's just hyper emotional. How do you criticize with, without offending and, and being able to move forward and, and develop a strong culture? Yeah, precisely. The answer is in first establishing psychological self-regulatory -reg skills, right? And of course, this is something that you, you know about regarding our history in that this sets the tone that everyone must be made aware that a strong emotional reaction in the first place is consciously or not a choice that's made in terms of how to interpret reality. And so by setting this understanding first of psychological, what I refer to as preparation, this is what then instantiates a dynamic that is that much more ready and receptive to aiming a critical lens at all problem situations, right? That first we have to establish this dispositional or temperament transformation that any human with a clinically healthy brain is capable of doing. And it is on the basis of reinterpreting ideas that lie at the foundations of how we interpret them and then react. Excellent. And would you say that that skill, because I, I think it's, you know, that's, that's a skill that's to be developed. Um, do you think that after a certain time, it becomes a habit within that company and somebody that is stepping into that culture uh, will kind of absorb, you know, via osmosis or are they going to need to be taught kind of how this works? How, how does that fit in? Yeah, that's another very good question in that, one example is not unlike what you just stated. So if, if everybody listening can imagine, you know, what would the understanding be, you know, entering a new professional organization in which every interaction you have with an existing employee, department manager, leader, executive is one of equanimity that you, you just not seeing anyone lose their temper. You're, you're not seeing anyone react badly to a situation. And on the basis of, you know, monkey see, monkey do alone, there's something to be said regarding what each one of us learns from simply criticizing the behavior of somebody else that criticism occurring internally, right? So questioning is this is adding in the conjecture, the guesswork, imagining that internal dialogue of this individual who's new to this environment and the questions that arise in their thinking in terms of, this is amazing, what's going on here? I haven't seen anybody lose their temper. I haven't seen anyone react strongly to anything regarding a personal situation or a professional one what could be going on here? Well, you know, what's the explanation for this equanimity that exists amongst everyone? This is amazing. 
And then you can just let the cascade of questions roll in terms of maybe they ask somebody, this is amazing. I've never seen a, an organizational culture like this. What, what's the secret? What are you guys doing? So that's one example. But the other is with respect to, you know, what I'm developing with my team here is that every new individual would immediate, immediately have access to this application. And, and, and this is just part of being read into the organization. Here's the application, pull it up on your phone, go through everything, bring yourself up to speed. And so there's more than one way of learning in terms of what is outwardly observable, but the internal mechanics of learning are always the same. And it's the same as the knowledge creation, criticism and conjecture. It's the only way that we learn. And I cover that in the explanatory form in this application. Excellent. So the criticism and conjecture piece, that's just such a fascinating piece because, uh, you know, like I said, it's just um, almost like a, a, a true like paradox with thinking how to, you know, progress to anything right now. It seems like whenever someone is criticizing, it's just creating wedging a, f a further divide and, and nothing is happening. Uh, what is what is the proper way to go about that criticism and conjecture so you can yield the best result? And do you have any examples of that? You know, somebody criticizing uh, an idea or people working together with critical thought. Uh, you know, what what can you say to that? Yeah, great questions, by the way, Jared. There are more than one forms of criticism, and what you're referencing is more of the inflammatory or incendiary type. And that must be distinguished from the substantive type, right? And so pulling some, from some more of David Deutsch here, what, what everyone is most well served to be critical of is only the contents of theories, the contents of ideas, not where they came from, you know, not who said them, simply ideas. So it, the answer is to, to learn to be substantively critical, only critical of the substance of an idea and aiming that lens of criticism towards what the factual attributes are of a given idea or theory. What, where this goes in a direction that is not helpful for anyone is when ideas are interpreted with emotional primacy. So that's a little bit of a technical way of saying someone interpreting an idea first with emotion and then perhaps only secondly with rational cognition. And as you pointed out, this current situation, or rather situations, right, because we have the, the COVID-19 that's a factor globally, and, and perhaps more so at least brought to the fore recently, these, these resurfacings of the examples of racial injustice. And in that when we, when we look at either of these, we have a choice that we can make. Anybody has a choice that they can make, whether they want to interpret this subject matter solely on the basis of factual attributes, right? So just, just pragmatically, versus emotionally. And of course, you could imagine some confluence of the two. And, and, and what everyone is most well served to understand is that there's just no benefit from interpreting situations of consequence with emotional primacy because of how this mode of interpreting the world compromises our best thinking, right? Compromises our ability to see the broader picture with, with a, a term that is relational processing, to have, you know, the most uninhibited access to our short-term memory. All of these cognitive and sensory information processes are most accessible and are operating most fluidly when we are in states of equanimity particularly states that are not being interfered with in terms of upregulated negative emotion. And so the criticism, you know, we want it to be substantive and only aimed at the contents of ideas or theories and not where they came from or who said them. 
Yeah. And it seems like that's such a skill that needs to be worked on now more than, than arguably ever than I've seen in, in my lifetime. Um, it seems like just emotion and getting people scared, getting people angry. That seems like it's selling very well for a lot of outlets around the world. And, you know, the more people feed into that, I feel like the further they're getting away from this uh, pragmatism and being able to think with rational thought. And, you know, it's just such a, a, a bad slope to go down uh, because it just gets you further and further away from, you know, what is supposedly to be the truth. And, and I think that's just a, a dangerous thing for a culture to be uh, shifting towards. Um, and that, that's why I think what you're doing is great, especially with the businesses, uh, you know, cause if, if you can separate your business culture from the underlying culture that, um, you know, you are in global, uh, you know, locally, regionally, globally, uh, and, and kind of create your own subsect of culture within your business, then you're getting away from that. Um, and that's, and that's great. Um, I, I would add there that. The, the best that can be done is to foster an environment in which potentially the most powerful cultural influences can arise from. And so to, to extend upon what you just mentioned there, the, 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 you know, the best thing that a business could do, it, it, it would not necessarily, I would frame it a little differently than the way you did, Jared, in that the, the distinction is one that ultimately you would want to be made implicit to just what's existing as, as opposed to any sort of explicit reinforcement of, you know, we're going to do things a lot different around here. And then even more importantly than that, what we know is there's no way of knowing or accounting for where the most powerful cultural influences will come from in a given human's brain, right? There's just no way of knowing. So, so no matter how exceptional a cultural dynamic might exist, you know, at the workplace, for example, there's no way of knowing whether that will have the greatest imprint on an individual who's employed by that organization. There's no way of knowing whether that will have the greatest influence on their thinking versus some lyric in a song that they heard, right? Or, or some dialogue set in a movie that they watched or some conversation that they had with someone outside of work. Just, just any, those are just a few examples of, of what could serve as any potential cultural influence. And there's never any way of knowing what might ping the strongest in terms of resonating with an individual. And so that's why the, so the most that can be done is setting the example of the most effective and robust type of culture and then just thinking optimistically about this having the intended example upon everybody who's part of it. So back to, you know, the, the culture in the workplace uh, with how this is set up, with how your program is set up, could you have somebody who's very low on that totem pole uh, you know, approach somebody very high on that totem pole with some kind of thought, some kind of criticism and conjecture and, and have that move the needle in that company. Yes. And I, there's actually a second technological piece that, you know, I won't talk about on air here, but we could offline just because the proprietary nature and it's still in development. There's a second technological piece that is going to allow for that exact scenario that you provided that, Every individual, no, where they, no matter where they exist in the hierarchy, must, as you alluded to, have the opportunity to criticize an idea. And, and, and not only to criticize an idea in the way that may be being thought of by any listener, but have the ability to contribute to problem solving. Um, that might be a little bit more accessible to the, to the listener in that one of the examples of the, the most effective type of leadership is a leadership that maximizes the talent of everyone in the organization. And if you do not have a tool for allowing that talent to be manifest and recognized, then what that means is you have untapped talent in your organization. And so 
what I've developed with my team is a technological answer for how anyone with problem solving talent can have an opportunity to contribute to the problem solving anywhere else in the organization. And I, I would have to think that would do uh, some great things for that employee's psyche as well. Um, just their buy-in into the company that, hey, I can, I can approach you know, somebody higher up with, with my ideas and they're listened to, and I feel like I'm really part of this and I'm able to contribute. That's exactly right. And another word for that is ownership and how when ownership is a, you could, you could look at this as a standard of empowering any individual who's part of an organization. And it's, and it's one of the most effective forms of doing this in so far as any individual who has the, the actionable recognition that my ideas can make a difference here, that I'm being given the platform to problem solve at high levels that potentially exist many levels above the one in which I'm currently employed in terms of my job title. This is one of the most effective forms of, as you stated, boosting that psychological interpretation of any individual. And in fact, what certain studies have shown is that something like that can actually be more effective than salary. Right. This is the this is the sense that an individual has that they have responsibility, that they are contributing to the bigger picture, that they have the opportunity to exercise the limits of their creativity. And, and as it turns out, that's arguably the most important thing for any individual, that when any individual, Jared, thinks objectively about what it is that they are most critical of at the workplace, it's, it's quite probable that the answer they will land on is restrictions on their own creative freedom. And so this technological answer that me and my team have developed is one solution to unlocking the creative freedom of every individual, no matter where they exist in the hierarchy. Now say somebody is working in a company and that creative freedom is, is heavily restricted. Um, you know, they feel almost kind of suffocated in that culture. Yeah. You, what advice would you give to that employee? Read stoicism, right? <laughs> because that employee is in fact existing in a microcosm of a totalitarian regime. That's exactly what we're talking about. Someone who exists in a regime that resists criticism in, in which ideas coming from the top are not challengeable, are not open for collaboration. And what's more, in going in the worst direction, there can actually be consequences to pay for voicing criticisms against ideas coming from the top. And so when an individual, you know, and, and we're describing a organizational workplace dynamic, but this could be any number of other dynamics in your know, military and sport in a interpersonal relationship, you could let your imagination run. And what the Stoics shared with the world 2,500 years ago, going back to the, the first phase was this, this one truth that is as far as I'm concerned, irrefutable, that the, the one thing that every human has power over that no one or nothing else can influence is our own thinking. And the only way our thinking can be influenced by anyone or anything else is if we interpret it in such a way that allows for the influence, right? And it's critically important that every individual understands that this is something that we all have a choice over. There's no law of nature that indicates or that requires that we all interpret reality in a certain way and therefore react to it in a certain way. And I cannot overstate how critically important that is. So it is this understanding that is that, in my opinion, the most helpful for someone 
who's existing in a scenario that I've just described as totalitarian and their creative freedom is being strangled and they are not fulfilled, their interest level in what they're doing is not high, that provided they don't have any other viable options to pursue in the short term, the most they can do is learn to reinterpret the situation differently such that these conditions that are outside of their power, this individual can learn to create a way, a form of interpretation that protects them from these external factors that to an untrained mind could be interpreted in such a way that ultimately is self deprecating. So it's a psychological skill that ultimately the Stoics developed over 2000 years ago that is absolutely viable. And, and as far as I'm concerned, will be till the end of time. Yeah. Stoics were definitely, definitely onto something. I, uh, man, what's Ryan holiday. He gets big into the stoicism stuff. I think in some of his books, um, he actually had the daily stoic, uh, journal and then, um, another, uh, book to go along with it. Anyway, uh, shifting back, kind of shifting back to Nova Sind, which for all you listening out there is, is the product that James is talking about, uh, kind of this, this map for business to, uh, maximize, optimize their culture in the proper way. Um, to me, looking at your program and having worked with you in the past, it seems like one of the best things about this program is how bulletproof it is to any and everything happening, happening around you. It doesn't matter. It, they, there could be uh, an awful you know, global pandemic where you know, the death rates are sky high and may, maybe you know, things are just looking terribly, terribly grim. Uh, it, you know, you could go on and on with different scenarios, but correct me if I'm wrong, but there's not one of those scenarios that would derail this culture that you would be able to set in place in these businesses. That's exactly right. And going back to this stoic reference, the, the, what, what the stoics shared with the world was an example of how to achieve this one example only. And if you think critically about you know, what we were speaking about, it is this understanding that there's a difference between our thinking, right? And, and, and we have to draw the distinction that it's, it's one thing to have control over our thinking, which we do have. What we do not have is control over the thoughts that initially enter our brains, right? So, you know, I can say out loud, knowing that everybody in the listening office audience is going to hear this, I can say something random, a, an outdoor grill, the size of the great pyramids. And, you know, everybody listening has no choice, but to have, they have to deal with that image of that charcoal grill or whatever it is, the size of the great pyramid. So that's what we do not have control over. We do not have control over thoughts that enter our consciousness where the control enters is, okay, I've downloaded that into your brain. You're, you're, you, you've unavoidably been challenged to not imagine this enormous charcoal grill. However, you now get to choose what to do with that. And I have many different analogies that serve to assist one in understanding that it's no problem if that COVID-19 idea enters your mind. It is no problem if that thought of a sick relative or a close friend who lost their life. It's no problem if that idea has entered your mind. What you need to understand is you have control over that idea once it is in your mind. And it is going through many different types of explanations of how to learn this skill. That is, that's what's built into the, my Novacind model of Epic Consulting. So these are acronyms, by the way, for those listening, that NOVA is Latin for new and SIND is Danish for mind. So NOVA SIND means new mind in two different languages. And the Epic Consulting model covers, that's an acronym as well, the epistemology, the psychology, the intellectual and cultural consulting 
that I perform with these different conversations and modules. But yes, the, the, the point there is that when you talk about, you know, the world is on fire, metaphorically speaking, it's only one interpretation that might use the descriptive language of grim or horrible or terrible because another interpretation, and again, interpretation is a choice, Another interpretation from someone else who's been trained in this way might be, well, it is what it is. And we can talk about the, say, the scientific explanation of why everything is burning, to use that analogy. And we can focus on the factual attributes. It's a choice we can make. And the, and the person who has conditioned their mode of interpretation to exist in that way is, in a sense, bulletproof against whatever happens and not because they are suppressing the idea that is sort of challenging them for interpretation, but simply because their mode of interpretation is entirely different and they're just not processing reality in the same way. And the whole idea is what, what the advantage of this is, is every individual can learn to process or to interpret reality in a way that is most helpful to their existence. That's the bottom line. It's, it's funny that you bring that up. Uh, it reminds me of uh, our past talks where uh, one of the takeaways was uh, think interpretation, that interpretation was the key. And yes. if you look at my alarms that I have set in my phone, one of the alarms still has the caption, think interpretation. And uh, funny enough, it's under an alarm that reads stakes. So apparently I needed to flip some stakes. But <laughs> if you That's can, fantastic. Yes. People can see that. Uh, so yeah, the think interpretation stuff is phenomenal. And I think that applies, uh, you know, to, to everybody, you know, let's zoom out for a second and, and just look at, you know, civilization as a whole. I think these are some phenomenal skills, uh, to, to practice and to acquire. And I think that helps, uh, the state of culture in general. I agree 100%. It's, it's understanding which underpins which, which, which subject matter understanding implicates another most effectively. And the way that I've thought about this has summed with my epic consulting in that the, the end of the game here is the, is the psychological transformation. That's the whole point. And it's understanding what so deeply implicates human psychology that ironically is missed in many psychological and psychiatric discussions. And what I mean by that is the way that epistemology and culture are implicated in human psychology, in human psychology, I'm not convinced that that's effectively integrated into the discussions that stem from the communities that arguably are set up to inform people of the, these most these most effective worldviews that any individual can adopt to, as I stated a moment ago, live life in the most helpful way. And so it's what I've aggregated in my consulting that is sort of my answer for completing that picture. Excellent. And where can people find uh, your consulting and kind of follow along with what you're doing? Right. So, Website still being developed right now. I can be reached at james at novasind.com and you know, we'll go from there. Excellent. And I'll, I'll throw that in the show notes and I will update the uh, episode description with a website when it's up and running. James, thank you for joining me today. I had a great time talking culture and I think the listeners will have a lot to chew on here. Thanks for having me on, Jared. All right. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Strategies Wealth, Health, and Self Show. I hope that you had a great time listening to James's amazing insights on culture and the philosophies behind it. There are some amazing principles to extract and use. I hope you can find these helpful and implement them wherever you see fit. If you have any questions for James, I will link the best way to get a hold of him in the show description, and I will do my best to get some information out on Novacind, his cutting edge culture building program. If you have any questions for me, go ahead, direct them to my LinkedIn account, Jared Valdir, or you can hit me up on Twitter, Valdir68. 
Either way, I'll get back to you. That is my goal. That is my guarantee. I'm not going to leave you hanging. I want to help answer any questions you have because there's some dense material in here. And I hope that people have questions. And I can reach out to James. We can answer these questions and get you moving and building culture the right way. So thank you, guys. I appreciate it. And hope you tune in to the next episode of the Strategies Wealth, Health, and Self Show. Until then, I'm your host, Jared Valdir. Thanks for joining, and I'll talk to you later.